it's particularly fitting on this day that we're able to bring you this program from our exhibit about the space station, the international space station, the space shuttle, and future human spaceflight. Because we're delighted to have as our speaker today Victor Glover, who is a NASA astronaut. He comes to us from a background at the Navy, where he was a pilot of uh, F-18s, a naval aviator. They don't just have pilots, they have aviators. Um, and who is now a part of the 2013 class of astronauts, an elite group of eight who have been picked to really train for the next steps in human spaceflight, which is very much what we are about here at the museum and specifically here in this gallery. So I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Victor Glover. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday to be here with us. And thank you to the Smithsonian for hosting this event. Thank you to all of the sponsors, and especially thank you to the folks in the room who are making this happen uh, and, and working hard to see this. What we're here to do, you know, they invited me here to speak at this event. However, I don't consider myself to be in that category of the space and aviation pioneers, but I am standing up here because of the work of those aviation and space pioneers. Right behind me is a jacket from Sally Ride and Guy Bluford, the first American woman in space and the first African American in space. And it's because of folks like that and a whole bunch of folks all over the planet that uh, we were able to do what we do. So thank you for coming out this morning.
you're like me, but I can look at pictures of people in space all day. But you know, you got to see all phases, launch, on orbit operations, landing. You got to see phases of our training. And I love that video because it shows every time you saw an astronaut, you probably saw three or four other people in the picture. And uh, Scott Kelly, the gentleman who returned from the one year mission in space, he would always say, human spaceflight is the greatest team sport on and off the planet. And that video shows you just some of the effort that it takes to make what we do possible. When we're in the neutral buoyancy lab, you saw that great facility, 100 by 200 by 40 feet deep, 6.2 millions of gallons, 2 million gallons of water where we train for spacewalks. When you saw the two people in the suit, did you see them surrounded by those divers? We have a whole team of folks, flight controllers, trainers, even the logistics and uh, budgeted folks that make what we do possible. So I play that video as a shout out to all of them. So welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the training, about the, the background before I got to NASA and, and what we've done since we showed up, uh, my class in 2013. And, um, but you know, all, all of you adults here, thank you for coming. But I'm really grateful for all of these kids that you brought. And so I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to them. And uh, so if we ignore all you grown-ups, I apologize now, but this is for the kids. So I like to start with this question. And I know they tell you in school, and it's important to you know, have your manners, wait, raise your hand, but you know, don't talk out of turn. But I want you to yell out, OK? If you know what you want to be, I want you to yell it out. What do you want to be when you grow up? Anybody, what do you want to be? Uh, astronaut. astronaut. I love it. I am doing some good recruiting here today. What else? What do you want to be? Astronaut. Uh, another astronaut, yes. I'm seeing a trend. I'm seeing a trend. Well, you know what? What do you want to be? Astronaut. Another one. NASA is going to have a lot of applications the next time we hire astronauts. But you know, there's a lot of parts of the room where I'm not hearing answers from. And I think the most common answer to this question is, what do you guys think that's going to say? I don't know. Say that again. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know. That's the most common response I hear. But you know what? It's OK. I'm standing up here wearing my pajamas, and I go home and play with really expensive toys and you know video game type things. No, these are really sophisticated systems, but it's kind of like playing with video games. So I don't really know what I want to be either, but I want to talk to you about some things that you can put into practice right now. I don't know how smart I am. People say, oh, you must be smart. I, I don't know how to measure that. I don't know how smart I am. But I can control some things. And these are things that you can control, too, and you can put them into practice right now. And you should, and you should put them in practice all the time. And it is to be gritty, to be a lifelong learner, and to be a good person. And we'll talk some more about that. I'm going to tell you some stories about my education and my career and what got me to NASA and then what this training is like. But I want you to remember that I'm telling you these stories because I'm hoping to connect with something that you've done or seen. I've already done high school. We've got high school students in the audience there. Mm -hmm. Any of you planning on going to college? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did that a few times. And I've had a career that I've loved. I haven't actually worked a day in my life. I love what I do, and I would pay money to do it. So um, maybe it's, there's something that you're thinking about doing that you can connect with in these stories. But the purpose of these stories is you. Okay? I came here. NASA sent me here. The Smithsonian asked me to come here to be with you, to spend some time with you. Your parents woke you up this morning. I know they made you brush your teeth and get dressed, comb your hair, but they brought you here for you, OK? So remember, in, I'm going to tell you these stories. I want you to think about something in your life that these can connect to. I hope so. All right, so I'm originally from California. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures, cousins and an uncle. And uh, any idea which one of those is me? <laughs> It's really deceiving because I have a whole lot of hair. <laughs> there it is, that guy. Another picture with hair, OK? I'm going to put all pictures up with, that, with my hair. Um, so uh, I want to tell you a story about when I was in elementary school. Um, I was in fifth grade, and we had a program called MESA, Mathematics, Engineering, and Science Achievement. What got me into it was building cars powered by mousetraps building bridges out of popsicle sticks and balsa wood, and then they would stack bricks on top of it until they broke. So I was in there to do stuff with my hands, make a mess, and then break stuff. But they snuck in science and math, making speeches, giving speeches, writing essays. And so I had to learn about some of those things too. But our advisor, his name was Mr. Hargrove. He was one of our fifth grade science teachers at Allison Elementary School in Pomona, California. 
And he knew that I had this tendency, you know, I would do really well on my tests, but uh, I might turn in my homework, maybe not. And he was giving me a pep talk, encouraging me to do all of that work, to be all that I can be. And he said to me, he said, you know, if you work hard, you would be a great engineer. And I have to admit that in fifth grade, I didn't know what it meant to be an engineer. I thought it meant driving trains. <laughs> that's funny now, but that's true. And I didn't know what it was. And so I didn't have a, a mentor that had studied engineering in college. And so, but his belief in me made me think that I could do it. And to this day, I am still trying to live up to that belief that Mr. Hargrove had in me. And so I, I know I said I was going to talk to the kids, but to you adults in the room, any educators in the room, teachers, parents, you should raise your hand too. We are constantly engaged in educating. Thank you for your service. And set those bars high and believe in those kids. But don't forget to communicate your belief in them. Because what Mr. Hargrove said to me in fifth grade still drives me today. And I wouldn't be standing up here if it wasn't for that conversation. So a story from high school. Um, I was a pretty, uh, earlier someone asked me, you know, what kind of a student I was. I think I was average. I was really, you know, good in math, but I wasn't always good in the study habits and skills and doing all the work. I, I was involved in community service, probably did at least as much as my peers, maybe a little bit more, and I was really good in athletics. I loved to wrestle, play football, I ran track, and so you kind of squish all that together. I think I was an average student at, you know, but one of my um, uh, best experiences uh, happened um, in, in a calculus class, I'll tell you about. But um, I do want to show you a couple pictures real quick, though. So the, uh, the pictures up there are some of my good friends from high school. Uh, I was a normal kid. I, I put the first picture up, though, of me in my cap and gown because I graduated. And that's most important. You're going there for, for a purpose. Your parents are sending you there for a reason, okay? And so um, I graduated. But I also I was a normal kid. I still had fun. I went to the movies and uh, I, did, I had extracurricular activities and hobbies, but at the end of the day, I, I got the diploma, and that's what your parents are sending you there for, and to grow. So back to this pre-calculus class, Gerald Robinson, Mr. Robinson, my pre-calculus teacher was also like Mr. Hargrove, trying to encourage me to get, to get the best out of me, and he did something that changed my life. We were working on adding numbers in a series, that, adding the numbers from one to four, add the numbers from one to four. And so I was doing my homework, I was doing my homework. And I, I noticed that if I write the numbers out like you see on the screen there, they made a shape. Kids, what shape is that? It's a triangle. That's right. And to find the area of a triangle, you actually turn it into a rectangle. So if I'm adding 1 to 4, now I have 4 by 5 in a rectangle. I multiply that together, I get 20 divided by 2, and it's 10. And I noticed that pattern when I added 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5, that this pattern would work. And I could figure out how to add those numbers up with that formula. The number, so adding the numbers from 1 to 10, you take 10 times 11 divided by 2, 55. 1 to 10 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus, all the way to 10 is 55. And I was like, whoa. And I was in his classroom scrawling numbers and pictures on the board. And Gerald Robinson, Mr. Robinson, walks in and sees this on his board. And I said, Mr. Robinson, I discovered a formula. I don't know what we're going to call it, you know, the Pythagorean theorem is cool, so I'll, the Victorian <laughs> theorem. And he takes the, the calculus book and he flips a few pages and he shows me that formula later in the book. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I think he saw, he saw sort of a little disappointment. Like at 16, I was actually like thinking I had discovered something nobody else had seen. But he did something that changed my life. He said, why don't you teach that to your classmates? You explain it. That was one of the first moments that I thought, boy, I know people have said I need to go to school and study engineering, but maybe I actually, maybe I can do it. Maybe I can do the work. I could tell you stories like that for an hour, but I won't. I won't keep you. Uh, I know those seats are a little hard. So I graduate from high school, and I go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I studied engineering. I was on the wrestling team. I was on the football team. Had a great time there. Um, and I met this girl. That's a picture of she and I. Tutoring. We used to go to junior high schools and high schools to talk to young kids about the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math. You remember that program I told you that I was in in fifth grade with Mr. Hargrove, Mesa? I was a Mesa counselor when I was in college. 
and I used to talk to those kids about making balsa wood bridges. This is about making mousetrap cars. You see the mousetrap in my hand? It's got an antenna on it to make lever arm. We, we can build mousetraps later outside. They got supplies down the road. So she and I traveled all over California doing that while we were in college, and we traveled so much that we started dating, and now we are married, and we have four kids, four daughters we're blessed with. And um, I'm very grateful for those days. This is something that's always been important to me. I've loved doing this from, from as early as I can remember. That other picture is graduating. Again, I went to college and I met her, so the most important thing I got out of college was my wife. But I also got my degree. I went to college and I finished what I started. It's important to finish what you start. And so I left Cal Poly. I was in the Navy. Joined the Navy. I got commissioned in 1999, got my wings in 2001, and that picture with all those guys in the green is the first time we took the venerable F-18 to the boat to learn to land it on an aircraft carrier. That's my first time being on an aircraft carrier. Uh, what a good memory. Um, and then I showed up into a squadron and got to fly this machine for three years, living in Virginia Beach. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, this is over uh, a region where we would uh, air refuel, and so I was air refueling, and the guy in the back had a camera and said, hey, pop a flare, and I'll take a picture. So that's a great picture, a great memory from that time. 2004, summer to fall of 2004, and then I left there, and I got to go to test pilot school. I went back to school, and I spent a year learning to test aircrafts and systems, computer systems and weapon systems. I got to be a test pilot for two years, and then I went back to school again, the Naval Postgraduate School. And I took a, a master's degree part-time. And then I went to school full-time. The Navy sent me to study politics and information and military use. Uh, and I went to, we call it war college in the military. So I went to school again. And then when I finished that, packed up the family, and we moved to Japan. And I went to another squadron. I flew on the George Washington for uh, two years, deploying with uh, some folks that are here in the audience. and. Uh, Two great years uh, of our lives. And this is a really special picture. Um, one of the guys that uh, worked on our airplanes in that squadron took this picture of me landing on the boat. And so I'll just describe to you, there are four wires on the carrier. We generally aim for number three. And uh, I will tell you, in this picture, I landed on number three. So this is a good landing. Uh, what, actually, you'd see there's no wire there, though, underneath the tail of my airplane where the hook would be. Because we land on it so much, they have to replace them. And so they had taken it off this day. But that was a, that was a pretty good landing. So uh, this is a special picture, though, not, not because of where I, the airplane touched down, even though that, that's important. Um, it's a good picture because this was one of my last carrier arrested landings. And I left there to come here to DC. And I didn't know that I was going to get this job, so that's actually one of the last times I will ever get to do that. So, very special picture for me. So, I moved to Washington, D.C. I um, decided instead of working in the Pentagon, I was going to apply for something, do something very different, and I got to go work in the Capitol. And this was one of my favorite days. I was sitting at my desk doing my work, and I had some free time. I called up Congressman John Lewis's office, a civil rights icon, the only living speaker from the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. You know what that is. That's where Dr. Martin Luther King made the I Have a Dream speech that changed this country and the world. He was a speaker there as well. He was a college student and leader of a, 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 a movement uh, called the Student Nonviolent uh, uh, Committee, and he got to speak that day. So I got to go over and meet him and just pick his brain, ask him questions. He took me out on his patio, and we had a great conversation. Then he did the same thing for my daughters. What a great experience, and, and what a great man, an, a pioneer. No, no less, a pioneer. And so I worked for this gentleman, and I spent, uh, it was a year-long program. Can you advance that for me? I'm having trouble. I worked for this gentleman, Senator John McCain, a military veteran. He was a POW and now a senator, was a congressman, now a senator. And I learned a lot. One of my favorite days there, well, this was a great day. After we found out we got selected, a few of my classmates that were in the area, we got to go and he uh, had a, took a picture with us and got to sit and talk to him about NASA and the future. But he brought my whole class together and talked about leadership. And I got to ask him some tough questions and he got to talk to my entire, entire class, 17 of us, about, about leadership and about telling the truth even when it's tough. And I, that was a really uh, inspirational day. And so I was doing that when I got selected. I don't know if my batteries are running out here or what, but uh, next slide. I was there in DC when I got selected for this job. And I threw these pictures together because 
I could just sit on this slide for the whole hour because those folks are all, and I could put, throw more pictures up there. There's a Tuskegee Airman in there. There's one of my Mesa advisors from Cal Poly, my academic advisor from Cal Poly, and of course my family in the middle. That picture with my wife and my daughters and that beautiful F-18 in the background, that's like everything important to me in the world. <laughs> Not because of the airplane, but that F-18 represents a squadron, which is 250 people that come together in any climate, in any place to do things that you all need them to do. And that is an amazing thing to be a part of. So all of you service members in, in, the, in the audience, thank you for your service as well. Um, so all of those folks helped me to make this next picture, next slide, a reality. Next slide. I got to go from Congress to NASA and begin this journey of becoming an astronaut. Next slide. My class showed up in August, next slide, of 2013 to begin astronaut boot camp training, astronaut candidate training to become an astronaut. And uh, it's amazing training. Uh, we showed up and we started right away into the five basic competencies that you have to have in order to be an astronaut. Is that working? because I'm, I'm going to need it. OK. Um, next slide. Next slide. That says, Minya Zavut Viktor. That means my name is Viktor in Russian. We all had to learn to gavarit paruski to speak Russian. Uh, can anybody imagine why we have to speak Russian in the astronaut corps? We don't have any rockets to go. We do. They're Soyuz rockets, and we ride with the Russians. Yeah. And that vehicle is made by an aerospace company in Russia, so the buttons, they're in Cyrillic. They're not in English. So we have to learn to read, speak, uh, and, and hear over the radio in Russian. And uh, we have to learn technical things in Russian as well. So the, the language training is, is, is very challenging. I try to do about six hours a week. That stretches your brain. It's very challenging. Next slide. We also have to learn international space station systems, because if the toilet breaks, who do you think has to fix it? Whoever broke it, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, you can't call a plumber, though. We don't have space plumbers yet. Maybe one day we will. When, when, when we work and live in space now, you guys. Anybody here 16? Everybody 16 and younger, raise your hand. Everybody else look around at these hands. Humans have worked and lived in space continuously longer than all of these folks have been alive. We started living on the space station, thank you, for November 2nd of 2000. So in November 2nd of last year, we hit 16 years continuous. And so we are beyond 16. We're working on our 17th year of continuous human presence in space. That's a big deal. Whether it's on CNN or MSNBC or not, that's a big deal. So thank you, NASA. So, but that's why you have to learn ISS systems, because when something breaks, you have to fix it. It also helps you to become a capsule communicator, the people that when they, Houston, I lost my toothbrush. We're talk, they're talking to a crew member or an engineer who has also gone through systems classes so you know, hey, it's probably over there by the vents because everything floats and it sucks down to the, the air conditioning vent. Next slide. That's a picture of my classmate, Drew Morgan, who is an Army doctor who graduated from Ranger School. You think he knows about telephone repair? This is us repairing a telephone on the International Space Station. So no matter what you did before, school teacher, doctor, scientist, engineer, pilot, you're going to find something in this that's going to stretch your brain. This is uh, working on robotics training in Canada. The Canadian Space Agency built the robotic arm on the space shuttle and the one that's on the space station. And we have to learn to do lots of different operations from putting a crew member on the end of it when they do a spacewalk to grabbing cargo vehicles. When we launch cargo to the space station, it has to catch the space station. If I want to send this science machine up there or this bag of apples, it's on the ground right now, not moving. Well, I guess technically we're all moving through space, but you know what I'm saying. It's got zero velocity right now relative to the ground. And the space station is going, anyone know how fast the space station goes around the Earth? Kids, how fast? Really fast, yeah, really fast. <laughs> 17,500 miles an hour. And so that apple, we have to accelerate it to 17,500 miles an hour. And we do that in these cargo vehicles that get up there and they phase and they do altitude burns and they get up close to the space station. And then some of them, we put it on autopilot and it coasts next to the space station, flying formation like we do in our military airplanes. And then we take that robotic arm and we reach out and we grab it, bam. And then we stick it onto the space station, pressurize it, and then the astronauts can open it up and get the food, pictures of their family, science, hardware, and clothes out of it. Pretty neat. That's one of the things we do with that robotic arm. It's like flying an airplane and 
using a computer at the same time. And one of my favorite parts of the training, learning to spacewalk. Proof that astronauts put their space pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> These pictures I, I like to show because as, even as I zoom in here on the different phases of getting suited up, getting put in the water, you see I'm not alone in any of these pictures, and you're probably looking at this one thinking, well, he doesn't realize that picture of him right there is him by himself. But if you look in the lower left and right corners, those two spots are divers under the water waiting for me to get all the way under the water so that they can go to work. They weigh us out so that we don't float or sink, but they also make it so that we don't have riding moments. If I were to twist on my side, in space there's not an up and a down, so if I need to get underneath there to you know, drill in that bolt, I can just go like this, whoop, and now I stay on my side underwater so that it simulates space. It's a, 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 this was the most fun part of the training for me. I had never done anything like this, and uh, this is a great part of the training, tons of fun. And so we get underwater and we practice repairing things, replacing computers, pump modules, and other hardware on the space station so that we can work to keep the space station that's in orbit 250 miles over our heads running and working so that we have that lab uh, in space. This is a time lapse of about a 20 to 30 minute period of us putting on the suit, getting pressurized, putting all the tools on, and then initially getting put into the water. And I like that video because it spans the pool deck and you see just how much activity. Just for the two of us, this is my classmate Nick Haig and I getting suited up and getting in the water. You see how many people are on the pool deck? Dozens of folks. Like Scott Kelly said, human spaceflight is the greatest team sport on and off the planet. We've got an amazing team. So when you finish all those things, I'm sorry, the last one, T-38 flying. I'm a pilot. How can I fit that? Again, no matter what you did before. You could be a scientist or a school teacher or a pilot. You're going to become a fully qualified member in the T-38. This is our afterburning twin engine trainer aircraft that we fly. And uh, it teaches you to operate in a physiologically challenging environment. You can be upside down, but the blood's not going to run to your head if I put one G on the airplane. And your eyes see the ground upside down, but your body says I'm upright. And so uh, it can cause your senses to be confused. Sound like anything you heard of? going into space, right? And we have to use controls while doing other things, pushing buttons and following a checklist, like those robotic operations I was telling you about. And you also have to talk to the crewmate in the back and work together on the same thing. It's like living with a crew on the space station. And you also have to talk to people that are far away. Air traffic control, control towers. It's like being on the station and saying, Houston, station, I lost my toothbrush. You have to get used to talking to folks that you're not in the same room with. And so everybody becomes a fully qualified member in the T-38. And uh, that's a great shot of a bunch of us, eight of us flying a formation uh, for one of our remembrance days. We fly over the tree grove where we plant trees for astronauts who have passed on. And we do a missing man formation. So this was a very special day. Uh, we do that for them every year. And once you get done with that, you become an astronaut, a member of this great team of explorers. And I like to say we're ambassadors of the NASA vision to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown for all humankind. That is, those are great words. I love those words. Does anyone recognize this picture? That is an actual photograph. Shout it out if you think you know what's in this photograph. There is a moon in that. It, that moon has a name. It was popular two summers ago. Anyone remember the New Horizons mission? Okay, so another one. Everybody who is 10 years old, raise your hand. 10 years old or younger, raise your hand. We launched an, a spacecraft into space. It was going really fast, 25, 30,000 miles per hour. And it flew your whole life. It was doing that speed for nine years to get here, to take that picture. The first high resolution images of Pluto, that's Pluto and its moon Charon, were taken by the New Horizons spacecraft. And it was taken, the reason I tell you all that, this picture, the first up close images of Pluto were taken on the same day that my classmates and I graduated from astronaut candidate training. So that's a very special picture for me. And so is this. That's my class, the 2013 astronaut class. And you notice, NASA did something for the first time when they picked our class. There are four men in that picture and four women. First time in history they've done that. Yeah, that is worth applauding for. I think that was awesome. That's right. I have four daughters, by the way. Okay. So, <laughs> I do think that is awesome. 
So we showed up, we finished training, and uh, that's all of us graduating, all smiles, good times. And we became a member of this great group of explorers. The explorers. We have a need to find what is out there. It is a drive inside each and every one of us. The drive to wonder, to push the boundaries, and to explore. We expanded across our lands, settling new frontiers. We took to the oceans and learned that we could cross treacherous expanses in the pursuit of discovery. And then we took to the skies and flew. But that wasn't enough. We left the planet and redefined what was possible. We flew in space. We walked in space. What once was a melodramatic flight of fantasy became reality. Then, a new generation of spaceships captured hearts and minds for three decades and helped build a castle in the sky that is our lasting hold in space. We have always looked up. For centuries, we wondered what was on the other side of the sky. And we have begun to answer that question. We have learned that all the exploration humankind has achieved is only a beginning. Right now, men and women are working on the next steps to go farther than we have ever gone before. New vessels will carry us, and new destinations await us. Everything we have ever accomplished leads to this moment in time where exploration will now take us to the planets and the stars. Our nearest neighbors in the night sky have beckoned us, invited us, dared us to reach for them. We are the explorers. Throughout our history, we have taken both small steps and giant leaps in that pursuit. Our next destination awaits. We don't know what new discoveries lie ahead, but this is the very reason we must go. I love my job. Who's ready to go? <laughs> ah, I love that video. Um, anybody recognize the voice in that video? Who was it? Wow. Okay. You, okay. What voice does Peter... Optimus Prime, that's what I was expecting. It is Peter Cullen's voice as Optimus Prime, yes. Wow, okay, we need to talk. I hope you want to be an astronaut too. Um, yes, very special. So we became a part of the astronaut corps. And uh, I'm, I'm living this dream job. It's, a, it's an amazing and humbling and challenging and exciting, and did I say humbling and challenging and exciting experience. Um, and so those are some stories that I thought, you know, might mean some things to you. But remember, Kids, talking to you. It was about connecting with something. And I told you earlier some things that you could be now and forever and that you should try to be. Anybody remember any of those? What was the first one? Be gritty. Number two, be a lifelong learner. Oh, I love it. If I could get my kids to do this. What was number three? Be a good person. So I'm going to just give you a couple little specific things that I think are important about those. So being gritty, what does that mean? It means work hard. And I know you hear that. Your parents tell you that. Well, I'm telling you again, work hard. Not just at the things that you like, especially at the things that you don't like. The greatest obstacles that I have encountered in my life were when I didn't believe in myself. Yeah, I've had external obstacles, but those haven't been as tough as I've been on myself. And if you recognize that, it makes you look at the obstacles that are out there in a different way. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. I love this saying. Someone said it to me once, and I take it. I run it through my head every day. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Do any of you get nervous if you have to make a speech in front of people? Come on, hands up. Let's be honest. Come on. Because there are some kids maybe that feel that way, and you grown-ups admitting it will help them realize it's okay. I, my hand is up not to encourage you to raise my, your hand, but because I get nervous as well. But you know what? I practice. I practice. And if you practice... Get your little brother or sister, make a speech. Get mommy and daddy together, give them the speech. Tell your teacher, hey, before I do that presentation to the class, can I just show you, give them the speech. 
And by the time you've done it enough, you get comfortable. You know your stuff. And you're going to get up there, and guess what? Those butterflies are going to creep up. You're going to get nervous. But you know what? When you focus on something and you train, you get better. What you put your energy into, you get better at it. And you'll get up there in front of the class, and the butterflies will come up, and those butterflies will fuel you to fly and you'll be good at making speeches, even if it still makes you nervous. If you could see up close, my hand is shaking, but it doesn't bother me. If you've seen the movie or read the book, The Right Stuff, that's really what it's about, being able to work through challenges. So go after those things that make you nervous. That's what being gritty is about. Being a lifelong learner. Next slide. This thing doesn't like me. <laughs> being a lifelong learner. Next slide. First and foremost, you heard me tell stories about folks who helped me find confidence, who find a path, find a major, and boy, I can't, I'm not gonna tell you I listened all the time, but I listened, and I'm so grateful that I did. I look back and I go, I should've listened to a whole lot more. Would've saved myself some headaches. Listen, you've got parents, they brought you here. You've got teachers and guidance counselors, ministers, pastors in your church. You've got Boy Scout leaders. You've got team coaches that are all concerned about you and your development. Listen. Next slide, or advance one, please. Another thing you can do to be a lifelong learner is to learn a foreign language. Yes, Russian, Chinese, learn to speak Spanish or French. But also, I lump learning to computer program into that category as well. How many of you are walking around right now with a, a, a smart watch or a, a electronic phone in your pocket or a gaming device, you ought to know how the inside of that thing works. And you know what those machines actually speak? It's math. Computer programming is just a specific kind of math. So I encourage you, if you're really good at math, if you're doing that kind of math where there's not a lot of numbers and there's a whole lot of words, you're fluent in a foreign language or another language. Advance one, please. For those of you that are still in formal schooling, and being a lifelong learner is about connecting formal schooling and informal schooling, what you learn out in the real world with what you learn in the classroom. And when you synthesize those things, they call it experience. And when you have a lot of experience, they call that wisdom. And who doesn't want that? One of the keys to succeeding in a formal setting is review. If you're in the grades where you have one class all day, if you take five to 10 minutes to review that stuff, if you have something hard, you're gonna be good at it. You're gonna be one of the best people at it. If you have, say, high school seven classes, five to 10 minutes per class would simply be 35 to an hour and 10 minutes. And if you put that time in, you can bring your grades from average to excelling. And here's some specifics on how, what I would do. You take your notes that you wrote, and maybe you write like me, chicken scratch, so I can't always read what I wrote. So do you think I'm gonna remember it a week from now or at the end of the semester? Nope, that day I need to go through to make sure I can read it all, and what I can't read, electrophoresis, ah, okay, rewrite it. And then while you're rewriting it, you're reviewing it, you're running it back through your mind, and you get to that part, uh-oh, I don't remember what polymerase chain reaction actually means. Circle that. And then you go to class early, and you tell the professor, the teacher, I don't remember what the polymerase chain reaction is, and when they explain to you how important that is to being able to do DNA sequencing, now it's stuck in that brain. You just did two things. You did two things. One, you filled in that gap of information because the teacher is then going to move on to the next subject that builds on that. You did something else that is equal, if not more important. You showed that teacher that you care. Those educators in the room, raise your hands up again. When the kids come to you for questions outside of class, do, do you remember those kids? You generally say things like, boy, that Billy is smart. Boy, Susie is smart. Boy, Jordan is smart. So it's two, two important things that you're getting done. Next slide, advance one, please. And be a good person. And it's, 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 it's weird to, to, to go in. The, I'm not the judge of what it means to be a good person, but I can tell you some things. If you ask yourself, what would my mama think of this? What would my grandma think about these decisions? You're probably going to make better decisions. If I was up here telling you not to listen to your parents and don't study and to eat garbage and to not work out and sit on your butt and watch TV and play video games instead of making the video games, my grandmother would not be happy with that. And it's on TV, so I, she would know. I'd get a phone call. <laughs> what would your grandmother think? That's a great question to ask yourself. Next slide, advance one, please. It's about making healthy, rational choices. 
It's about putting good things in your body and about good things coming out of your body. It's about getting a good night's sleep. It's about learning, advancing, and, and not being too big-headed to, to grow and to learn. Healthy, rational choices. Next slide. It's about practicing etiquette. I tell my kids, etiquette is respecting the people around you. Yeah, it's a bunch of things I want you to learn and to understand. It's not about just putting the knives and the forks and the cups in the right place. Okay, bread, meat, water, which one is mine? It's about understanding that those people sitting next to you, maybe they're going to have a conversation or maybe they're doing something that you need to be respectful of. Practicing etiquette, like anything else, what you put your energy into, you get good at. Working here on the Hill, working in Congress, I saw how important things like handwritten notes were. Very important. Things that we don't always think about. It's, we're quick to send a text or to leave a message or an email, electronic mail. But a handwritten note stands out. I know people who got jobs because they wrote a handwritten thank you note to the person that interviewed them. Etiquette and teamwork. Boy, how many times? Human spaceflight is the greatest team sport on and off the planet. And we spend a lot of time trying hard to take care of ourselves and to take care of each other so that we can together accomplish a mission. And you have to practice that. It's not something you're just going to show up and be good at on day one. Next slide. And the last one, and to all the service members, first responders, and all of you parents, you do this every day. You, do, you serve something bigger than yourself. And for you young folks, look for that thing. I'm not going to stand here and tell you to follow your passions. I'm going to tell you, find a way to serve and when you put your energy into doing something else, you are going to grow a passion that you'll keep for the rest of your life. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. One more slide. One more slide. Some websites that you can go to and get more information about the missions, the science going on in the space station, and what we do, some of our educational initiatives. Now, while that sits up there, if you have questions for me, there is a microphone here. Yes, you have to stand in the spotlight. But please, come forward, ask questions. I would love to take some of your questions. I'm going to ask you questions. There is a quiz if you don't ask me questions. <laughs> come on up to the microphone. Uh, I was it's on. OK, fine. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story, especially about the things that you did early on that helped you um, succeed to where you are now. And um, to people that are in college or have already maybe had some of the experiences or have gone through elementary school and high school and all that, what would you tell them as they move on to the next step of their life post-college that helped you continue um, building on your success? Go back to that slide. I think those things are all still applicable. But I, I, w I would say this. What, whatever it is that you want to do in life, if you love music and, and, and art, uh, I, it's so important, especially as we now live in space. We need to take more parts of our culture. We don't, you know, humans don't live by, you know, bread alone, right? It's not just about the food and the toilet and the life support systems. You want music and games up there with you, and so those things are important. While you're in college, you might want to go and be an artist, a singer, but you know what? In a technical education, I, I try to stop saying STEM. It's become a thing, but you can't get a degree in STEM. But science, technology, engineering, and mathematics will serve you no matter what. Like I said, we're all walking around with some type of an electronic device. You ought to know how it works. Um, if you want to, uh, I ask kids, do they like math? And some hands go up. I say, do you like money? Well, people who are good at that other thing usually keep more of that other thing. So, you know, there are lots of ways to skin that cat. If you uh, uh, study math and science, no matter what you want to actually do in your career, those things are, are going to serve you. So that's one. And here's another. If you do go into the technical workforce, you saw a picture up there when I was working on the Hill. I found that technical folks, the science and technology workforce, generally tends to be a little bit ahistorical and apolitical, meaning they're just not into it. They don't like, you know, it's not about politicians. Politics is about the will of the people, our structure, our, our roads, our water system, the things that we share collectively. And it's important to follow along and understand how those things work. Read. Read, long-form journalism. I could give you some names, but I might get in trouble with some good things to read, but long, well-written articles. You know, you can't get all your news in social media. 140 characters just don't cut it all the time. So you have to read things that are written by people who have a specialty. Read. I, afterward, ask me when we're off the recorder, and I'll give you some things that I think you could find out about what's going on in the world. And Yeah, great question. Thank you. How old do you have to be to be an astronaut? 
Wow, I think we've had folks selected in their 20s. So usually a college graduate. Most of us, though, are in our 30s when we're selected. So I know to you, you're thinking, wow, that's old. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> I love it, I lo honesty. Uh, I'm thinking, that's pretty young. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Good question, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever lived in space? I have not yet. I am waiting to be assigned to a mission. When they ask me if I'm ready to go, I'm going to say, yes, let's start this training, and I'm going to go up there and hopefully live on the space station for six months. But not yet. Maybe soon. Okay, I've still got my quiz. I will ask you questions. How fast is the space station going around the Earth? 17,500 miles an hour. Okay, they're going to get harder. So how fast does it actually go around the Earth? How long does it take? Spit it out, spit it out, come on. 90 minutes. So how many times a day does the space station see the sun rise and set? Carry the one. 16. And we love sunrise and sunset, don't we? Don't we like it's a special thing when you can actually sit and watch the they're, they're not just sitting watching the sunrise and set, but sometimes when they have free time, that's what they want to do is look out the window and take pictures. That's what they say. Yes, sir. Thank you for your wonderful, enlightening presentation. Thank you. I have two questions. One is, what is the uh, most uh, challenging uh, obstacle you overcame as a uh, teen and as an astronaut? And secondly, what is your view your future? My future. Um, great question, sir. Thank you. Greatest challenge as a teen, greatest challenge as an astronaut, and what do I see in my future? As a teen, it was ignorance. It was myself. That's something that I did inside. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I didn't put it in this talk. I could have just sat on that one slide of all those people in those pictures for the whole hour. I was a pretty decent athlete. I was the athlete of the year in my high school. The Marine Corps gave me an award for that. And then the Naval Academy recruiter came to my house and said, do you want to play football at Annapolis? And I said, no, thank you. And then not long after that, the West Point recruiter came and said, hey, do you want to play football at West Point? And I said, no, thank you. Not interested. And um, Annapolis actually came back and said, do you want to wrestle? I did pretty good my senior year and was all state. And they said, you want to wrestle at, at Annapolis? You know what I said? No, thank you. And I'm standing here before you, a naval officer and a naval aviator, and I gave up that opportunity to go get a free education at an equal to an Ivy League institution. And, uh, but it was because of my ignorance. I wasn't exposed to that, and I didn't know what the opportunity on the other side of that was like. And uh, so I tell that story often, though, because it was me, 16, 17-year-old me, that just couldn't see it. But everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Greatest obstacle is an astronaut. This, this opportunity is, is unique. It's amazing. I got the phone call standing in the Russell Senate office building. I was in the rotunda where you see all the senators getting interviewed. I was standing in there when Janet Cavandi, astronaut Janet Cavandi, asked me, do you want to move to Houston and start training to be an astronaut? And there's only one answer to that question. <laughs> yes. But um, that decision also meant leaving the Navy full time. I'm still an active duty Navy officer, but it meant leaving. I've got friends in the audience that I served with. And um, my first squadron, uh, he was my intelligence officer. Uh, and my best friend and a naval intelligence officer, he was the guy in that picture in high school with all the hair. That was him. <laughs> Good to see you, brother. Um, leaving that, leaving my Navy family has been the greatest challenge of this astronaut journey of mine. Hi. Hi. Do you have a question for me? Yes. What is your question? How long does it take? To the moon. How long does it take to get to the moon? That is a great question. So I'm not a, a rocket scientist, okay, but I play one on TV. Um, so I believe the fastest thing that we sent to the moon left Earth. So when you see the big fire coming out from liftoff, to, it wasn't going to the moon. It was going a lot farther. It passed the moon six hours later. Six hours. How, anybody remember, did I say it earlier, how far is the moon? 240,000 miles. Was it cooking? It was cooking. That was the New Horizons vehicle that was going to Pluto. 
It had to go that fast because it had to get all the way to Pluto. It passed the moon six hours after takeoff, I believe. Maybe it was eight hours, but it was, it was very quick. When we send astronauts to the moon, it's a couple of day trip. So it depends on what the mission is and what's going and how much stuff has to go with it. So anywhere from a few hours to a couple of few days. Good question. You're very welcome. I've got more quiz questions. All right, and this one there's no answer key for. What do you think one of the biggest challenges folks have in adjusting to living in space is? This is obviously is something that changes. This isn't like a hard and fast thing, but, sir. It does affect how you grow. You actually like so, gain an inch or two when you go up there. Ooh, getting nauseous. That's uh, you do get the adjustment period where you you feel congested. You feel uh, your stomach awareness. Yeah, you may be getting nauseous. Um, this could be a long-term thing though. That you may adjust to over time. Uh, I used to think, you know, when you see those commercials on TV for a new bed, what do they tell you? This is made with the same technology that NASA uses. Yeah, you know, and you're like, oh man, floating in space must be the best night's sleep. And sleep, for some people, it's great. And for some people, that's one of the toughest things to do. But think about this. So yeah, you're probably floating and you're feeling like, oh, that's a great position. But here, when you get in the bed, the cool sheets, that's a sensation that you're used to. Laying down. I'm standing. The pressure's on the bottom of my feet. The blood is being pulled to my feet. My heart's pushing it around. When you lay down, all of that changes. Your body senses all that. The somatosensory, the, the tactile sensation of laying, all that pressure along the side of your body. We try to simulate that by strapping in a, a, a sleeping bag into your crew quarters and then you kind of just strap yourself into it so that it holds you up against the wall, but you can't lay down in space. Think about it. So sleep is one of the more challenging things to do. The other one, using the bathroom. We won't talk about that. <laughs> How long does it take to get to Saturn? I'm sorry, sir? How long does it take to get to Saturn? Probably not nine years like Pluto because it's a little bit closer. But you know what? You want to find out? Let's ask someone exactly and see if we can get ourselves an answer here. Let's see. Siri, how long does it take to get to Saturn? Okay. Give me a moment. Here is what I found. Six point zero five years. That's what Siri says. But you know what I think you should do? You go look it up and you tell me when I come back. Deal? More questions? Well, listen, out of my etiquette for your time, if you, okay, please. Um, space exploration and the benefits for actual people on Earth, mankind. What do you tell them about that? What do you, especially recently, have we been discovering more things that have a direct impact on our lives on, on Earth? Absolutely. Uh, it depends on how much time they have. As you can see, I like to discuss this kind of stuff. You know, it's kind of interesting to me. Um, so, one of the things that uh, we have working on the space station experiment going on is is this uh, protein crystal growth uh, experiment where we can grow very nicely structured and much larger protein crystals. And what that enables us to do here on the planet is to make chemical therapy medicines that are better and, and more suited for whatever it is that you're taking it for. So uh, that's the pharmaceutical companies are very much interested in is it feasible to manufacture things in space or at least what we learn about them in space, can we make better uh, materials here on the ground? Here's another one, astronaut health. We are one of the primary uh, re research uh, objects up there and bone health, you've got this uh, cortical and trabecular bone, sort of the hard outside and the softer inside like the marrow on chicken leg, you know? So those two parts of your bone, they go away and come back at different rates and we were finding astronauts were coming home with less dense bones. So we developed a chemical therapy, some medications that they can take. But the biggest thing is we've changed our exercises. We have a machine that's like a big weight machine and you've got to lift heavy. Right before you come home for landing, you are lifting heavy weights, up 600 pounds and it's a vacuum tube because there's no weight in microgravity. But you've got this weight protocol and a running protocol. We actually started sprinting because they found that the heel strike 
helps your bones to stay more dense. Well, guess who really cares about that? Half of the world's population, women, osteoporosis. Yeah, so those are, those, that research is going on right now, but I can guarantee you those things are being fed right back here on the surface to help folks on, on the planet deal with uh, bone health. Yeah, lots of, lots of good things. And the, those websites that I put up there, you can read about as much time as you have. You can spend it reading about the missions and going on on the space station. Good question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Do you have a question? Yeah. What's your question? Um, how does it feel to be in a rocket ship? How does it feel to be in a rocket ship? Well, I haven't been in a rocket ship. I've been in a spacecraft. And you know what? It's on real to know that something you're in is going to go into space. Very unreal and cool. Great question. Thank you for the question. Okay, so I think they're giving me the signal that we have to wrap it up. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out and, and uh, allowing you to do this. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.